chapter 24, all right? Matthew chapter 24. As a result of what's going on with the coronavirus, the pandemic, the pestilences, right? As a result of what's going on with the pestilences, we see now the dire predictions of worldwide famine. Uh, The United Nations has said that now, already, because of what we've done so far, an additional 130 million people across this globe face starvation. All right? When they say that the cure is worse than the cause, you can begin to see some of that reality. Um, And anyway, but famine as a result of what's transpired. Not only that, but you probably didn't hear this in the news, but there has been a great rise in the number of earthquakes recently in the ring of fire. Um, There was an earthquake in San Diego. There was an earthquake here recently that hit Japan. There was an earthquake, uh, I believe just last week, that hit Indonesia, was felt all the way into Australia. Uh, In um, some of these areas, it's just happening again and again, all the way down to South America. Chile had a big earthquake last week. Uh, Iran, which is not in the ring of fire, had a large earthquake. When you think of all that's happening, and by the way, we're still waiting for the big one. They keep telling us it could happen at any time. But remember what Jesus said? It's interesting the three things that you find in Matthew 24, 7, when uh, Jesus says at the end of the verse, there shall be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in divers or various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Can I add into that when you're looking at things in the last days? I was shocked to read just this week because this is not someone that uh, you would think of as super liberal. But Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel suggested that all children be microchipped. All children. And that this microchip will give an automatic reading of, I believe, their temperature, but then also they're talking about how it could go off like with an alarm. So when they're in school, if they get within six feet of somebody else, it starts ringing. All this kind of nonsense. Benjamin Netanyahu. I was shocked. There is a bill right now in, in the United States House in what, they have, what they're trying to pass, and um, this one has to do with tracking and tracing American citizens. But did you see the number they chose for it? H.R. Bill 6666. Why did they choose that number? Are they doing it in open defiance? Why would they choose that number? What's behind that? It's just amazing to me. It's almost like they know what the Bible says, and they're just almost like pushing God, you know? Tracking, tracing, all these things they say we got to do to move past this pandemic. I'll tell you what, this whole thing that's going on, when you look at the world scene, it's like, wow! Lift up your eyes, for a redemption draweth nigh. This is incredible stuff that's happening. And people that I never thought would get into some of this, and they're going along with this. And how about the Americans that are such good communists, snitching on one another? Isn't it alarming? All of these things, it's, it's one of those, th- again, the Bible tells us what it would be like in the last days. And... Um, While I do not believe, uh, obviously, that these things are being ultimately fulfilled, I think we see the rumblings of them. We see the rumblings of what is coming, I believe, very soon. So that means uh, that the rapture of the church will be taking place. And nobody knows the day or the hour. It could be 100 years from now. I'm just saying, wow. It's never been closer, and it just seems so near at this point. Um, so is God's people, right, <laughs> looking for that blessed hope, looking for that blessed hope. I think we realize what, uh, what this world is headed for, and um, there will be a problem solver that's going to come on the scene. We know that too, don't we? Um, and uh, that's, that's another matter, how Jews as well as Muslims alike, the Orthodox Jews and the Muslims, all looking for their Messiah, They're all looking for the Messiah. Of course, it's the Antichrist they're going to accept. Again, that's another subject we can go on and on about. But let's look instead tonight at Matthew chapter 4. Wednesday nights, we have been studying saints in quarantine. We wrapped that up last week. 
Tonight and next week, I want to look at Christ in quarantine, all right? The Lord Jesus Christ, when he was in the wilderness alone for 40 days and 40 nights. And of course, what that led to was the temptation of Christ. The temptation of Jesus Christ is ultimately what we're going to study. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 1, we read these words, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him up on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Let's start with a word of prayer tonight. Father, I thank you tonight for the opportunity to hold your word in our hands, to learn from Jesus Christ, from his example. Uh, Lord, this time that he spent in the wilderness, these 40 days of fasting, and Lord, also to see the way that he set a pattern for us in overcoming. We're thankful for his impeccable character, uh, Lord, for his perfect nature. And uh, Lord, we're thankful that as a result, we have a uh, a great high priest who is touched by the feelings of our infirmities and, and uh, the one who is perfect and can, can fulfill that role of the high priest before you. Father, we're thankful for, for all these truths. I pray that tonight you would help us center our thoughts and affections on thee, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've got three simple thoughts tonight as we look at this passage in Matthew chapter number 4. And it all starts with a declaration. And that's the first point tonight, a declaration. And really, the understanding of chapter 4 and what Satan is doing goes back into chapter 3. Remember the Gospel of Matthew? It pre presents Jesus Christ as the king, in particular the king of the Jews. And so the genealogy traces the, uh, the line of Jesus Christ back, giving his, uh, his right to the throne uh, as king of the Jews. We see the wise men who came. And uh, there they asked what? Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Right? We see all of this. And then in Matthew chapter number 3, we see the baptism of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus is baptized and his ministry on earth is about to begin, the Father makes a declaration in verse number 17. It says, Lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom... I am well pleased. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The declaration of the Father, as Jesus Christ comes up from that water after His baptism, this is the Son of God. Now, in light of that, we notice Satan's words. Because he begins in verse number 3, what does he say? Look at what Satan's first words are here to Jesus. If... Thou be the Son of God. Notice again in verse number 6. If thou be the Son of God. So we notice here that the devil, in the first two temptations that he gives, is directly challenging what the Father had declared. And so all of this temptation is coming about as a result of, of the declaration of the Father. There are numerous truths we can glean from an overview of this passage, and uh, even before we get into some of the specific things, and that's what we're going to look at tonight, is not so much the specific temptations, but more of, of an overview of the whole temptation of Christ. One of the things that we glean in this passage, and we can see, is the doctrine of the Trinity. 
We see it at the baptism of Jesus Christ in chapter number 3. Of course, it's Jesus himself being baptized. In verse 16, it says, Lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and lighting upon him. And of course, then the Father, the voice <clears throat> from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We also see then in chapter 4, verse 1, then Jesus, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit. And so again and again through this passage, we see the Trinity. We see the Lord Jesus Christ in His submission. We see the Father in His will. We see the Spirit in His leading. The declaration of the person of Jesus Christ, as we saw in verse 17, is now followed up by an examination. And that's what this temptation really serves at, is an examination. So Jesus is set forth as the Son of God, and now the temptation is going to put His character to the test. Is Jesus Christ truly God? Is Jesus Christ perfect? Is Jesus Christ suitable to be the Lamb of God? Satan was here looking for flaws. Remember in the Old Testament when Daniel had that position as second to the king in, uh, in Babylon. You remember that? And you remember the story where, where those who were jealous of him and envious of his position came and they began to seek out and search through Daniel's life, probably looking through his business dealings and, and coming to, uh, to try to see if they could get him to, to succumb maybe to becoming drunk or maybe uh, uh, defaming the king's name. But they couldn't find anything. He was blameless in his character. Well, even more so, Jesus Christ. Satan comes and he begins to inspect him and trying at every point to get Jesus Christ to fall. Do you remember the words in Hebrews where it says he was tempted in what? All points, like as we are, yet without sin. Just today, we finished uh, the pews being installed in here. And uh, last night, uh, when we had come in, they wanted us to, uh, to look at everything and inspect everything before they bolted them into the ground. And so Pastor Ben and I and, and uh, Brother Brian was here, and so we started looking down the aisles, looking for the imperfections, right? And I can remember, well, Pastor Ben last night, he got up, and he was able to see it. I couldn't tell. But he looked at this side and he said, I think that that side is a little closer to the platform than that side is. That the pews were a little bit cockeyed, right? And the guy was standing there and, and uh, the installer, he's like, look, now you're a pastor, I'm a pew installer. I've been doing this for a long time, right? And so he just wanted us to take his word for it. Well, we decided, I decided, you know what, I'm not just going to take his word for it. I said, hey, hand me a tape measure. I'm just going to start at the back, and I'm going to measure them all the way down and see if they're all 36 inches apart on both sides. He got a little flustered, and he said, we'll do it. So we went back there, and he had these wooden devices that he would set down in between the different ones, and it wasn't too far. We got from the back, and all of a sudden, oh, well, how did that happen? It was out of kilter. It wasn't right. The funny thing was, they got all the way to the front, and the guy that was doing this side, he didn't have his thing set up right, so they got here, and now it was all leaning like this. And uh, the guy said, hey, what are you doing with your... And, and it wasn't set to 36 inches, it was like 35 and a half inches, and by the time you've done 16 pews, that adds up, right? And uh, anyway, we put it to the test, we inspected it. Is there a flaw? And that's what Satan's doing. Is there a flaw? But the Father's will was that Jesus Christ would shine forth. There is no flaw. He is perfect. Perfect, He is God in the flesh, and therefore He is suitable as the Lamb of God. Perfectly suitable. What do we know about a lamb before it could be sacrificed? What was it, the requirement? It was, it must be spotless, without blemish. And so Jesus Christ must be without blemish. He must be perfect, in His holiness, and He is. And so He was suitable as our sin-bearer, holy, blameless, without spot, the very 
Lamb of God. So then the declaration of the Father in verse 17 of chapter 3 is getting put to the test in chapter number 4. We also see that Jesus Christ was, notice verse 1, let up of the Spirit. It wasn't just Satan's doing. This was of the Father's plan that Jesus be tested, that he be put to the test. We know it simply in the verse, uh, verse 1, Jesus was led of the Spirit. If Jesus was led of the Spirit, how much more should we be? By the way, the Word of God teaches that the Holy Spirit leads God's children. Romans chapter number 8, it says, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's one of the privileges that we have as a child of God, to be led by the Holy Spirit. He's our guide. He's our teacher. He's our comforter. He's the one who empowers us in our witness. He's also one who leads us. And that's what you find through the book of Acts as well. But Jesus was led of the Spirit. And again, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Notice, to be tempted. Let him into the wilderness to be tempted. Now, the temptation was not from the Father nor from the Spirit, but was permitted and used of God to show forth the character of Jesus Christ. Remember the story of Job, where Satan came and he wanted to tempt Job. He couldn't do it of his own volition. He had to get permission from God. And God gave him that permission. And he put Job to the test. We also noticed in this passage, or just a reminder in the Word of God, God doesn't tempt us to sin, but He does allow the temptation as an opportunity to bring out our true character. Furthermore, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that when a temptation comes, God is faithful and will always provide a way to escape. That's His promise. God never promises that we won't face temptation. Now, some of the temptations we face are because we're acting like fools. All right? If we're living in the flesh, then we're going to have temptation. But even those walking in the Spirit, even those being led by the Spirit, as we see here in Matthew chapter 4, will face temptation. The Bible says every man is tempted. Right? That's not sin to be tempted. The sin is to act on the temptation. Jesus Christ was tempted, but Jesus Christ could not and did not sin. Second thing that I have is to note in this passage is not just the declaration, but as an overview, we notice also the devil. We see, we see three different names given for him in this passage. Of course, devil uh, is one that's used the most prevalently, as it says in verse number five. But notice the first way that he's referred to in verse three. When the tempter came to him, he's the tempter. Not only that, but we also find in verse number 10, Jesus' uh, statement to him and addressing his name Satan, our adversary. So we see his name, we see his character. We also see in this passage that the temptation was not left to just any fallen angel. Rather, Satan himself was going to put Jesus to the test. Who was it that came to Adam and Eve in the garden? It wasn't any of the devil's minions, was it? It was he himself. Adam was the perfect representative of the human race. I would dare say that Adam was the smartest man, the strongest man, the best man as far as men go. He was the crowning achievement, so to speak, of God's creation. It was Adam, I believe, wiser than Solomon. Who named all the animals? Adam did. I believe stronger than Samson. Adam, the best that mankind had to offer. But Satan had no trouble finding Adam's weakness, did he? He knew exactly where it was. He knew it was in his wife. And he knew he could get to Adam through Eve. Adam willfully chose to partake of the fruit when Eve offered it to him. Satan won against the first Adam. Now he turns his attention to, with a writer of 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul calls the second Adam. But there was a difference this time, and that's this. Jesus was not only the perfect man, he was God. He was God in the flesh. Notice in the test that Satan brings, the timing of the test. Look what, what, what happens. Jesus is fasting, and of course the temptation doesn't come until we read the words in verse 2, 
When he'd fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. I, in, in my own experiences, I know that there's a, a certain point that you get in a fast where you stop being hungry. You stop being hungry. And my understanding is that the human body can take about 40 days of fasting, and that's the limit. So Jesus went to the limit as far as what a human body can endure. And that's when that hunger would really strike, and Satan knew it. And so the timing of his temptation, do you think that he knows when we are most vulnerable? Of course he does. He knows when to time the temptations that we face. Not only that, but notice in his temptation how he twists things. Notice in that second, in that second question that uh, Satan offers, that second temptation, verse 6, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, notice, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Do you see what happens here with Satan? This is what he's good at. He twists the word of God. He quoted Bible to Jesus in the midst of the temptation. He attempts to get people to believe that God's word contradicts itself and that it contradicts what the Father has said. He'll fight against clear scriptural admonitions with other scriptures, always twisting and distorting them. Here's an example. And I've, I've, I've heard it before, and unfortunately, in my past, I've used it before. Blow up, say some things, do some things in anger, right? Conviction comes. Conviction comes, and what do we do? Well, Jesus exercised anger when he drove out the, changers, the money changers in the temple, right? What are we doing? We're falling to Satan's temptation. We're twisting and distorting Scripture to what? To justify ourselves. That's right. And that's what Satan was trying to do with Jesus. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. By the way, I doubt that anybody else around me thought that my anger was justified. And that's probably one of the better tests of it. <laughs> And by the way, even if people thought it was justified, would God, the righteous judge, think it was justified? By the way, that's not the only way. Here's a common one in our society. Judge not that you be not judged. <laughs> by the way, I don't hear that a whole lot anymore, right? <laughs> because right now, everybody's being judged. You know, you better stick to the social distancing rules, right? <laughs> I'm going to call and snitch on you, right? No more judge not lest you be judged. That's what our society likes. They have to take it and twist it and distort it. So now, you know, you can't tell somebody that that's sin. Hey, that, that relationship you're in, that's sin. That's adultery. That's fornication. Judge not. Isn't it funny? Would, would anybody ever say that? As Imagine you pull up to the stop sign and you're about to go and I just fly through without ever stopping. And you say, hey, what are you doing? You can't do that. Judge not. That's what our society's doing. That's the same thing. God gave the law. He said, don't go past, stop. People do it. And then they cry out, judge not. When everybody knows they flew through the stop sign, right? It's not just that. Satan's good at this one, too. God is love. Stop hating. As though God just accepts everything. As though... That verse in Scripture that charity or love rejoices not in iniquity but rejoices in the truth doesn't exist. Or the fact that God is holy and all of God's Word is holy and pure and the righteous standard. As though somehow God can't be love and at the same time be judge, which He is. You see, Satan tries to pit God's attributes against himself. And then there's this beauty. You hear this one from people who call themselves Christian. I worship God, not the Bible. I worship God, not the Bible. I always ask, who is God? Well, you know, the God of the Bible. <laughs> kind of funny, right? Yeah. You see, Satan twists and distorts 
and he'll take truth. Like, we should only worship God. It's a lie that we're worshiping the Bible when we're doing what God says. You can't worship God without doing what God says. It's not worshiping the Bible. That's true worship of God. People twist. It's, and it's Satan who's behind that. He's the mastermind at twisting and distorting Scripture. You also find in this passage Satan's tactics. And this is very important for us to see. I think we have to be aware that he twists Scripture. Just because somebody's quoting Scripture doesn't mean they're sent from God. Uh, again, I think we all realize that in the day in which we live. Many today are twisting and distorting. But here's something else that he does, and that's his tactics. Hold your place in Matthew 4. Look real quick at two other passages. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And as we look in 1 John chapter 2, we're going to find what Satan uses primarily in his temptations. And there are three things mentioned in the world that, 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 that Satan uses. He says in verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world. Now here's the three. Here's the three things, the three tools of the world that Satan uses to draw men and women away. Notice, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Hold on to those three, all right, and go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Look in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and the first temptation, the temptation of Eve in the garden. And you're going to notice what Satan uses against Eve is those three things. You'll notice in this temptation, first of all, uh, again, he questions, just like with Jesus, if thou be the Son of God, he starts off in verse number one, yea, hath God said, always questioning, right? Always questioning God's revealed truth. But you'll notice here that what Satan says to Eve, notice in verse six, after he's done with, with what he's feeding her, notice, the woman saw the tree was good for food. So there's the lust of the flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes. And there's the lust of the eyes. And the tree desired to be desired to make one wise. The pride of life. In fact, remember what Satan offered, you will be as gods. Okay? Notice now back in Matthew chapter 4, where we are in the temptation of Jesus Christ. And there we're going to see the same three things. Those three tests is what Satan gave to Jesus in what he, in what he uh, tempted him to do. In verse number 3, notice, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. What is that? That's the lust of the flesh he's trying to operate by, trying to get Jesus to succumb to. Jesus is hungry. The Father said, fast. Satan says, eat, feed the flesh. The flesh is hungry. Act on that craving. We'll look at that in more detail next week. Notice the second one. The devil taketh him up into the holy city, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. Cast thyself down. Go ahead and act in your own will. Defy the will of the Father. Make yourself known. You're the Son of God. Everybody ought to know it. It's the pride of life in his second temptation of Jesus Christ. And then the third one, we see it in verse number 8. The devil taketh them up into an exceeding high mountain, showeth them all the kingdoms. Notice, shows them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. There he's tempting him through the eyes, the lust of the eyes. So we see Satan's tactics. There's one more of his tactics that I would add. He questions the Word of God. He tries to throw doubt on the Word of God. We see that in Genesis 3 and Matthew chapter 4. If thou be the Son of God, questioning the declaration of the Father. Here's something else that he does, and he's good at it. And that is, he seeks to make us believe that God is holding out on us. He wants us to believe that following God, that God doesn't have our best interest in mind, that God is holding out on us. Remember, that was the whole temptation of Eve, right? To get her to believe 
that what was on that tree of the knowledge of good and evil was more than what God had offered. To say, look at all that God has, all these trees. But God doesn't want you to have this because He knows in the day that you eat of this tree, you'll be as gods. You see? Same thing with Jesus. That's what He's trying to do with Jesus, Satan is. He's trying to act, act as though the Father is holding out on the Son. If you're the Son, shouldn't you be able to eat? <laughs> you're hungry. You're the Son of God. Why should you be starving? You see, it's that same appeal, trying to, trying to show God, trying to show the Father as someone uncaring, as someone who didn't have the best interest of the Son at heart. We notice then in this passage the devil, but we also finally then see the defense. In all of it, Jesus didn't fall for it. There's a verse in the New Testament. It says, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. I think that a lot of our struggle is that we often are ignorant of the devil's devices. But once in a while, it'll occur to us, you know, I think that, I think our adversary is behind what's going on right here. <laughs> I think this is satanic in what's happening right now. And, and we see that at times. We're in tune with that. But other times we're ignorant of his devices. But Jesus was not ignorant. He recognized the temptations, and he also recognized the truth. And that's what Jesus does. In every temptation, and this is the key in this defense, is you'll see in every temptation, what did Jesus say immediately? You see it, three words, verse 4, it is written. Again, in verse number 7, Jesus answered, he said unto him, what? It is written. And again, verse 10, get thee hence, Satan. Why? For it is written. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, answered temptation with the Word of God. How much more should we? How much more should we have a ready defense with the Word of God. If Jesus Christ answered with the Word, shouldn't we? This is an example for us to follow. Are you prepared with Scripture to fight off the temptations of the wicked one? We read of David, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that what? I might not sin against thee. Thy word as a protection. We read in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 6, that we're to stand, stand against the wiles of the devil. And what's that first item of defense? He says what? Stand therefore having thy loins girt about with truth. It's the very first defense mentioned in the armor of the Lord that is supplied to us that we might stand against the wiles of the devil. If there's a particular sin besetting you, I believe that we all have sins that we struggle with. Maybe they uh, maybe they change over time. Maybe it's the same thing we struggle with for years and years. But the question, have we looked into the Word of God for doctrine and reproof and correction for instruction in righteousness? Have we laid those truths to our own heart? Have we memorized them and meditated on them as we seek the Lord to help us to get victory over temptation and not succumb? We find in Jesus' life, he said, it is written. Let me point out again in verse number 4 and verse 7 and verse 10, because there's kind of a, a hidden truth as well. Maybe we don't see it at first. But I'm so thankful to read Jesus when he said, not it was written. He said, it is written. Even though he's quoting from the law, written 1,500 years before his time right now in the, in the wilderness, he didn't say it was written. He said it is written. You see, God inspired his word, and that's great. But you know what else? Very important, and that is God would preserve his word. The word of God says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Jesus himself said, Not one jot or tittle would pass away until all be fulfilled. And so in his day, he could say, it's still got the same authority. It's still the same truth. It's unaltered. It is written because it is the word of God, the living word of God. 
And so this must be where we resort and meditate and memorize if we would be successful against temptation. What you see of Jesus Christ in this passage, we, we learn that he was tested to reveal his character. And his character was spotless. He was tested by the tempter himself, Satan, the devil, our adversary. That wicked one comes and tries all of his tactics. The same ones that he tests us with day after day. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, twisting and distorting scripture, trying to give justification for sin, attempting to make the Father appear unreasonable and unkind and, and uncaring. You know, he does the same thing with you and I, right? Will you stand? Are you standing against the wiles of the devil? We need, like Jesus, to answer with truth and gird ourselves with truth and respond until, even as we see in verse 10, get thee hence, Satan. The Bible says in the New Testament, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There is an expiration date to that temptation. Submit to God. That comes first. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. We see it in the case of Jesus Christ. It says the devil leaveth him in verse number 11. Wait, that's a wonderful truth. <laughs> there is a time of refreshing. The temptation was past. Jesus stood, and praise God he did, because all of our redemption depends on the fact that Jesus Christ was the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Essential. This chapter is not just another lesson for us. It's an essential passage in our redemption because it reveals Jesus Christ is the perfect, spotless Lamb of God. Praise God for that. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you today for the opportunity that we have to be in your word, to look at the life of Jesus Christ and to see him, even in this temptation, Lord, how he stood. Father, we're thankful tonight uh, that you have revealed to us the strategies of our adversary so that we might know what to avoid, know how to prepare. Uh, Father, may our hearts uh, be, be set on thee, on things above. Uh, Lord, may we be in your word and may the word, the truth, be a defense to us. Lord, help us to evaluate if we've been giving in to the lust of our flesh whether we've given in to the, the lust of our eyes, just pursuing what we see and what looks good to us and what's pleasing to us. Father, whether we've given in to the pride of life, help us tonight. I pray you teach us by your word and keep these truths in our heart. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we go to prayer tonight, I know we had one prayer request that was sent in. That was to pray for Rochelle Anthony's a fellow that she has been witnessing to who has been deployed and will be returning to the States shortly. And so she has asked us to remember.